Jesus began to speak in the synagogue in Nazareth. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. But he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the t- in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. It was the seventh day, the day of rest, the Sabbath, Virtually every Jewish adult in the town of Nazareth was present in the synagogue for worship. Jesus, their hometown boy made good, would be there that day, and no one wanted to miss his teaching. Most of them had known him since he was a child. He had only just begun his ministry, but news of his teaching had spread. This was his first visit home. What unique words and blessings might Jesus bring, then, to his hometown? Their worship is, was similar to ours. Much of what we learned, much of what we know, we learned from the Jews. They would say or sing a psalm, pray together. Someone would read a passage from Scripture, and there would be a teaching. Anticipation was high. Jesus would be reading and teaching. At the appointed time, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. He opened it and read. Isaiah's words are the beginning and the heart of our story. We read them last week, so I'll read them again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of light, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed grow fr- go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The men, maybe some of the women, knew the passage by heart. But there's always the possibility that like this story for us, the words have become so familiar that their deeper meaning has been lost or forgotten. For God's word to live in us, we have to examine the old and ask what the words are saying to us now. What is God saying to us today? What is God calling us to do? Who is God calling us to be? And then Jesus sat down and announced that today, now, Isaiah's prophecy had been fulfilled. Oh, the people of the congregation were so proud of him, one of their own called by God to fulfill the ancient words of salvation to God's people. Who were the people there in the synagogue that day? They were all faithful Jews, following the God who had called them to be God's own, had freed them from slavery in Egypt, and led them out into freedom. Was there someone in the congregation who held a debtor captive or at his call to work 
because he or she couldn't pay off a debt? Was there someone holding a debtor captive with exorbitant interest rates? In Nazareth, were there people in prison because they couldn't pay their debt? Was there someone sitting there that day afraid of opening their blind eyes to seeing in a new way? Were there those who walked past every day pretending they did not see people there in the community, the poor, the hungry, slaves, beggars, lepers, ostracized because of their position or their bad luck in life? Weren't Isaiah's words just words, symbols of God's power? Surely there was no application in reality. This was getting pretty close to home. What could good news to the poor mean for everyone else? How did the people hear Jesus that day when he said Isaiah's prophecy was being fulfilled? They might have heard him saying he would overturn the system they'd become accustomed to and comfortable in. Was Jesus going to meddle in the status quo? But Jesus' next words were really shocking. He reminded them of two old stories, two stories of their history, their faith. The stories of the widow of Zarephath, a non-believer to whom God nevertheless had sent Elijah and Naaman the leper. Um, Excuse me. Yeah, right. And Naaman the leper, again, a non-believer whom Elijah cleansed. Neither was a Jew. Neither one of them knew the God of Israel. But because of her kindness and generosity, even in her poverty, God gave Elijah the power to heal the widow's son and to her the sight to proclaim her newborn faith in Elijah's God. Naaman, also a pagan, trusted that he would be healed by the God of Elisha, and he was. Was God more interested in a person's good intentions in life and in a person's hope in God than in the name of the God they worshipped? Perhaps the people in the synagogue that day had forgotten that the widow and Naaman were not Jews. Perhaps they'd never searched deeply for the meaning of the stories. They were, after all, people who believed their faith in the one true God was the only way to salvation. That should sound familiar to us today. When Jesus reminded them that Elisha and Elijah had taken God's blessings and healing to people outside Israel's communities, the people were furious. This was blasphemous. How could it be that God had called Jesus, this young man barely dry behind the ears, to suggest that God's love would be revealed to Gentiles. We see the fire of their anger in what happened next as they drove Jesus out of the synagogue and toward the edge of a cliff. So how do we hear these words today? They're part of our faith, too. Where do we see ourselves in the story of Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth? I've heard it said that the gospel is political and that if we don't believe that, we're listening to the wrong gospel. If we do believe that, we see that there's more than words here. There's a calling, a calling every bit as valid as Jeremiah's call, as Isaiah's call as Elijah's call and Elisha's, as powerful as God's call to Amos, Hosea, Ezekiel, and the other Hebrew prophets, as present as God's call to Martin Luther King, to Mother Teresa, to Mahatma Gandhi, to the Dalai Lama, to all people who have ever worked and prayed for peace and justice. This is a call to all of us, as urgent as God's call to a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a priest, a parent, a person who works in a phone bank or on an assembly line, to seek and be faithful to his or her humanity, to love and serve the people and the world 
God has given into our care. And the way we grow and serve is to love unconditionally every bit and piece of creation, just as God loves us. Let's look at Jeremiah's call to prophecy. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. If that's not political, I don't know what is. But I don't believe God's intent is violence. I believe God's plan is that cruelty, poverty, prejudice, injustice, resentment, ambition, anything that will harm another, even an enemy, be found, uprooted and understood at its roots, pulled down, destroyed, and overthrown, and that in their place we build and plant kindness, understanding, compassion, love. Before something new is planted, the old must be found and pulled up and destroyed. <clears throat> if you're thinking that sounds impossible in our world today, I am too. But we forget that God promises always to be in the world, working with all that is good and right. We may not see every day in the evening news the work of the Holy Spirit, but we trust, as Naaman the leper trusted, that the things God does unseen are accomplishing God's purpose. Our part is right in front of us, where we live, where we walk every day. Wherever we find injustice, hunger, poverty, homelessness, discrimination, wherever we see people who have no chance within a system set long ago against them, however we witness to violence, to and the destruction of creation. When we bring to light, speak up, and act in the ways God calls us to act, we answer God's call to us. We all are prophets. And at the soul of it all, is our will, that our love of all creation, all people, all creatures, be the love St. Paul writes about in his epistle, in our epistle today. This is another piece of scripture applied too narrowly and so misunderstood that its deep and critical meaning is missed. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. That's a high bar and we will not reach it perfectly. But with faithful practice, we'll grow in the knowledge and love of God and of one another. I think we should read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest this passage every day. Scotch tape it on your mirror. Place it on a card in your prayer book or in another book you're reading. Put it beside your bed to read morning and night. Pray that we all, will grow in that love of God and of one another, and that we will see with sight restored the work of the Holy Spirit and the part God calls us to play. Paul might have added, it is the love of God planted in each one of us. It just needs to be practiced, prayed over, polished, until we see more and more clearly the beautiful image of God within each one of us.